drive through life and it is so discouraging that God didn't bring us, I'm so glad, aren't you so glad today that God didn't bring us the bad news? Can you imagine? Where, where would we be today if he just brought us bad news? It just brought us news of condemnation and, and news of judgment. And Jesus Christ came to bring us just the opposite. He came, he said, I have not come to condemn the world, but I have come to save the world. That's what, those were his words. I have not come to condemn the world, but I have come to save the world. And I'm telling you this morning, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you've got going on, Whatever your friends know and, and whatever they don't know, none of that changes this. There is good news this morning because of this gospel. So I just want to spend a few minutes in it today, and then I want to just apply it to our hearts and lives. It's in Matthew 27 where Jesus is betrayed and he's brought to Pilate in verse number 1 of, verse, of chapter 27, the gospel of Matthew. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and elders met again to lay plans to put Jesus to death. They, again, this, these, weren't the, these weren't the broken sinners. These weren't the wounded people. These were the religious self-righteous. You see what happens? Religion gets so righteous. We as men, we create uh, philosophies and we create systems to fix ourselves. That's what religion does. And in their day... The, the people that should have been the people of God, to be honest with you, these guys right here that were plotting to kill Jesus, they should have been the ones that were announcing his return. They should have been looking for him. But they tried to become righteous on their own. They tried to fix themselves. And instead of recognizing the Savior, when they tried to fix themselves, it caused them to reject the Savior. And they missed him. And they plotted against him. It separated them from God. It says in verse 2, And they bound him, and they led him away. And they took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. It says now in verse 11, Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the governor, and Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus looked back and said, You have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders, here's the self-righteous again, when the leading priests and the elders uh, made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. He didn't answer a word. And Pilate said, don't you hear the charges that they bring against you? But Jesus made no response to any of their charges, much to the governor's surprise. The Bible says this. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover, Passover was the anniversary of the offering of atonement where the Jewish nation would slay a lamb to cover the sins of the people. Those things didn't coincide. These things don't coincide accidentally. God is the author and director of history. And so at the Passover, it says, it was the, the, the governor, uh, it was his custom to release one, a prisoner, to the crowd, anyone they wanted to. And this year, it says in verse 16, there was a notorious prisoner. He was an insurrectionist and he was a murderer. According to the scripture, his name was Barabbas. And as the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, Pilate asked them, which of them do you want me to release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And the crowd cried out, release unto us Barabbas, it says here that he said unto them again, which of these two do you want me to release unto you? And the crowd shouted back, Barabbas. And Pilate responded, then what should I do with this one who is called Jesus the Christ? And the crowd shouted, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he done? Yet the mob cried again, Crucify him! And so it says in verse 26 that Pilate released Barabbas. I can't even imagine what he was feeling and thinking. Accused, ready to be executed, released because of Jesus. So Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead-tipped whip. 
And then they turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Verse 27 says that some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus to the headquarters. And they called out the entire regiment. They stripped Jesus down and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and forced it on his head. And they placed a reed in his hand as a scepter. And then the soldiers knelt before him mockingly and taunting him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And they spit on him. They grabbed the stick and they struck him on the head. When they finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. And they led him away to be crucified. The Bible says that they led him to a place called Golgotha. It was known as the place of the skull. It was a place of execution. And there the Jews under the Roman authority watched the centurion lay Jesus Christ on a cross. They nailed his hands and feet, and they lifted him up for all to see. The crowd continued to mock him. The soldiers mocked him. Even the high priests cried out, he saved others. Let him save himself. The Bible says there was two thieves also being crucified that day, one on, on either side of Jesus. And one of the thieves continued just to rail on Jesus Christ to taunt him and to mock him while he himself was being executed. Something happened in the heart of the other guy. The other thief cried out, Why do you mock him? We deserve to be here. But this man has done no wrong. And then there was a movement of God in this guy's heart. Think about this. This guy's got nothing left. He literally has no chance to fix himself. He's got no opportunity to go to church for another time. He's never going to sing another song or give another offering. There's nothing he can do at this point to repay all the wrong he's done. So in mercy, he just cries out to Jesus. 